Welcome to the third part of the lecture. So the lecture in general is about conditional compilation. So we talked about how preprocessors and build systems can be used to uh, enable to realize conditional compilation. In the last part, we will talk about some problems in more detail and what could be, what is the research point of view on those problems? So what could be potential uh, uh, ways how to deal with this in the future? We will talk about feature traceability, feature traceability as one of the common problems that we will have whenever we have conditional compilation. So recap, uh, we have had our graph implementation, some source code for the graph implementation, and we've defined some terms. We defined the terms scattering and tangling. So again, what was scattering? Scattering means that we have split the feature among many different uh, situations, uh, many different parts of the source code. So this is obviously a problem. If I want to edit that feature, if I want to remove it, if I want to extend it, then I need to identify all those locations where it is scattered. We have talked about code tangling. Code tangling means that if I look at a certain class, uh, at a certain method implementation, I need to understand different features because those features are tangled with each other. And then we talked about feature traceability as the general ability to identify the location of a feature in source code. And when it comes to conditional compilation, it's not um, that easy to understand and see how comp conditional compilation, uh, whether this is actually part of the problem or part of the solution for feature traceability. So in, the, in one of the previous um, examples and slides, we had a view like this, where we had symbolic feature traces, where we marked all those features in the source code, but that's typically not what we have. Uh, we don't have this for single systems, where we um, implement the features, uh, but they somehow get lost somewhere in the implementation. But we also have the same problem uh, when it comes to clone and own, when it comes to runtime variability, and so on. So the question is, scattering and tangling a problem for single systems? Uh, yes, it is, because in a single system, I can have implemented certain features of our domain, and those features might be spread all over the place, or there could be several features affecting a certain class or method. Do we have the problems of scattering and tangling for runtime variability? Yes, we have. It's very similar to the view that we have right here, but we would have some additional conditional statements, uh, conditions where we include certain parts of the statements, execute some parts of the source code or not, depending on the value of features. And again, is code scattering and tangling a problem for clone and own? Yes, it is. Clone and own is merely a technique to, uh, to copy uh, the whole product into different branches, for instance, into different, uh, we can even split the system into different build systems, but still there's no notion of a feature. So we can hardly assess all the parts that are relevant for a certain feature, but it will be all mixed somewhere in those files of those systems. And third, is code scattering and tangling a problem for conditional compilation? We already talked about this briefly in the last part of the lecture. Yes, it is. Because even though there are certain positions in the code where it is marked, whether this part of the code, this uh, code block is uh, belonging to a certain feature or this include is needed when a certain feature is there, it's still spread all over the place, we still have scattering, and we still have tangling, so different kinds of features at the same position in the source code. So what is the feature traceability problem? And we already had a definition of feature traceability in an earlier lecture. We said feature traceability is the ability to trace a feature throughout the software lifecycle. So meaning that 
In requirements, I want to identify my features in the same way I want to do it in source code, but I also need this uh, when I do some regression testing in the test cases and which test cases to execute after a certain change or introducing a certain feature. The intuition behind feature traceability is we want to uh, find a certain feature in a certain product. And of course, this is easily doable in this, um, in this analogy here with uh, these uh, Lego parts, because in this case, we can easily recognize where this part is. But this is obviously a larger problem when it comes to larger software and software where the color is not so easily recognized. We want to refine our definition of feature traceability to better reflect what the lecture is about. Feature traceability is the ability to trace a feature from the problem space to the solution space. So what is a problem space? The problem space is basically what we modeled in lecture four. In lecture four, we defined a feature model and a configuration, and both is considered as the problem space point of view. We have some features in a domain. We make a selection of those features, and that's kind of the problem space point of view. In the last two parts, uh, in the first and the second part of this lecture, we talked about solution space. So how is the feature mapping achieved? How are features mapped to either certain files with build systems or to certain parts within files with preprocessors? And this is what we mean with solution space. Solution space is about the artifacts that we produce during software development. This can be source code. This can also be design artifacts or test cases. And their mapping to features. So we want to identify features that have been defined in the feature model in their corresponding implementation in the source code. So what is a feature traceability problem? The feature traceability problem is a challenge to trace a feature in software artifacts. That means in some cases we might be interested in all the locations. In some cases it might be sufficient to have some of the locations. If we consider there's a bug in the implementation, we are only interested in the location that is relevant for the bug. Uh, if we want to remove that feature from the source code completely, then we want to identify all the locations. And of course, we cannot see this from small examples, and we, can easily, we cannot easily see this from the software point of view. But if we consider the LEGO example again, that's kind of how the source code looks like. And then it's much harder to find all the locations of certain parts. And for those of you that have some experience with LEGO, it's even harder to find different shapes of, uh, uh, of parts than colors. So finding all the blue parts is much easier than finding all the parts that are four items long. So that's the feature traceability problem. And uh, the feature traceability can be supported by means of colors. So that's why it's not too far away from the analogy of finding like these blue pens uh, or finding blue uh, parts of uh, Lego uh, parts. Uh, but um, the idea of colors, of introducing colors, uh, was uh, uh, first uh, implemented in a tool called Feature Commander. It's uh, not, that easy, uh, not that easy to explain, but there's also another tool that will come later on that was slightly earlier available. So, but we will first talk about Feature Commander. In Feature Commander, every feature is assigned. Every feature can be assigned a color. That doesn't mean we need to assign every feature a color at the same time. So if you think of Linux with thousands of features, then we, we cannot distinguish more than like 10 uh, uh, colors or so. Um, so but uh, for a maintenance task, for instance, not every feature is relevant. So we only mark those relevant features for us. And we can use the same color for several features at the same time. Colors are used to support the feature traceability. Features are not assigned a color shown in the shade of uh, uh, features not assigned to a color are shown in a shade of gray. So we are using different uh, kinds of gray here to mark that 
This is some feature code, but currently it's not assigned a certain color. And we have visualizations that are based on preprocessor directives. So feature commander is a tool that is out there with the idea we have a preprocessor based product line already. And now we want to trace the features that are already occurring in the, the preprocessor directives. So there's a video here that we will link um, uh, and I will guide you through some features of feature commander is uh, uh, what we can see from the screenshot. We can see the file structure and open files by clicking on a certain node. So that's what you know from uh, other uh, integrated development environments. Uh, we can see the feature percentage for each of those nodes, for each of those uh, folders, uh, for each of those files. What is the percentage of this feature? How, uh, uh, how much of the code is affected by that feature? We can also get an overview on the overall file uh, by means of these bars that are somewhere listed here. Uh, then we can select the feature structure for the whole document, easily navigate to different parts, um, and we can uh, yeah, show uh, feature color inside of certain bars. And what we see is that the bars are actually uh, stacked to each other. So there's this part of the code, which is in that part, and this part, which is in that part. And in this way, we see the nesting level, the nesting of those preprocessor uh, directives. And we can use some tooltips to understand which of those bars is actually assigned to which feature. Uh, we can save and load those color assignments. Uh, imagine that you have done a certain assignment for a maintenance task, and then you can uh, use other assignments for colors for other parts of the source code. So Feature Commander is a research prototype uh, which hasn't been maintained in the last years. It only provides a static view in the source code. It only works for a particular um, real-time core for Linux, Xenomai. And there's further reading on some, the reason why this tool support was built is to uh, make some uh, experiments with humans, with developers, and to understand how these colors actually affect uh, the development, uh, how they affect uh, the developers in their maintenance tasks, in their development of the product line. And again, there are a couple of features here which are explained in more detail in the respective uh, video. So inspired by the tool feature commander, we also started at uh, some point in time to introduce colors into feature IDE. So a feature commander was initially envisioned by Janet Siegmund and others. Uh, what also They also produced the video that we've linked on the previous slide. Um, and we were sitting together and thought like, how, how can this use be used more frequently and in other cases? And then we started to re-implement some parts of the features of Feature Commander into Feature IDE. Um, so what we have there is some tool support for feature traceability. It's inspired by the Feature Commander. Colors and we can be assigned to features and colors are used in feature model in the configurations, in the package explorer, and the source code. And again, there's a video if you want to see it live with some explanations. Uh, but what you can see from here is that there are certain packages that uh, are relevant for all the features that we assign colors for. Um, there might be some uh, that have no variability in there at all, at least from those features where we selected colors right now. And there might be others only relevant to one or two features. Then we can see uh, another way of expressing the nesting over here. So we have certain blocks, and this block is nested in another block. This is also nested in the same block. And we, we see another kind of visualization over here. Um, uh, mainly for technical reasons, but it gives you what is the feature on the left-hand side and the nesting will be displayed in the editor itself. 
So something important to mention for this feature traceability, the question is now, these colors, how good do they support feature traceability? And what is important to notice is that while we always, uh, for maintenance tasks, are not interested in thousands of features, we can only assign those features a color which we are currently working with. Still, there is a problem with uh, like what can be supported by means of these technical uh, tools of this tool support. Assume you have uh, implemented certain features with preprocessor uh, based in a preprocessor based product line, and you implemented some uh, directives into the preprocessor code. If you have a feature that is simply not made uh, or not annotated in the source code, or if you have two features, but they're annotated with one label only, then you will not be able to identify those locations. So we can only locate features in the source code and only provide feature traceability to those locations that are actually specified with C preprocessor statements or with preprocessor statements and directives at all. Yes, another uh, vision, more visionary approach to uh, apply and uh, support feature traceability, but also an idea of improving this rather, uh, these rather problematic preprocessors overall by means of a concept which was introduced in the PhD thesis by Christian Kestner. The concept is called virtuous separation of concerns. And the idea is that we have some annotations on the source code, but they're based on the underlying structure of the source code. So we have, uh, whenever it comes to uh, source code, we typically have some structure, some hierarchy among those uh, languages, and we make use of this. Virtual separation of concerns proposes discipline annotations, which means only optional nodes in the abstract syntax tree can be annotated. And it is probably hard if you haven't hear, heard any compiler construction courses. If you have heard so, uh, then you will probably be familiar with the um, idea of an abstract syntax tree. So basically, you can imagine that you take the piece of text, you parse it, into a, within the compiler into a tree-like data structure. And for Java, for instance, this could have nodes for the packages, for the classes, for the fields, for uh, methods and fields, for the members, uh, and also for statements. And that's kind of uh, what we take into account, the structure, the inner structure of those files. We take this into account when annotating part of the source code. And then there's two support used to provide views and navigate in source code, and we will see this in a minute. What's important to note is the disciplined annotations will guide you, uh, will help us in a way that all the possible variants that we can generate will always be syntactically correct. And syntactically correct is, I've given you one example in the previous code, is there will not be a missing semicolon, there will not be a missing bracket or something like this because the uh, we will always first pass all the source code into an abstract syntax tree and all the annotations are made based on the abstract syntax tree and not on the texture representation. So what is different to what we've already talked about? What is different to preprocessors? The annotation of characters in plain text is done in preprocessors while we have nodes in an abstract syntax tree annotated with virtual separation of concerns. We have undisciplined annotations possible, for instance, a part of a, an identifier. I can even uh, annotate a certain bracket, uh, only a closing bracket, uh, things like that. And it can lead to generating of syntactically invalid program variants while it cannot, uh, while this is ensured that it cannot for virtual separation of concerns. And something which is a bit hard uh, for now, but we envision actually the physical separation of concerns. And we will talk about this in later lectures where we, uh, where the goal is to have a separate unit of code for a certain feature, like a component, a service or plugin, as discussed in lecture six, or dedicated modules, folders, and files discussed in lecture seven. So to have a look at this uh, at tool support, so virtual separation of concerns requires tool support, 
because we need to pass the document first and then uh, assign our features. Uh, and the tool that has been proposed and uh, implemented as a prototype by Christian, Ke uh, Christian Kestner is called Colored IDE for Colored Integrated Development Environment. Colors are used. Uh, colors are used to mark those features. It's based on an older Eclipse version and uh, based on the feature ID prototype. Uh, it was a research prototype and hasn't been updated in the last years. So what we can see from the screenshot is that we can uh, open our Java documents, for instance, but also many other languages are supported here uh, with a particular editor with a colored editor. So this editor will uh, have some additional colors in there. So colors, and this is interesting, there's no need for this preprocessor macros and directives anymore, but we only uh, use the colors in the source code here. So these colors completely uh, replace preprocessor directives as, uh, and this is a difference uh, compared to feature commander or the support for colors in feature ID. Features are relevant uh, for development tasks. I'm sorry. Are assigned to a certain color. Uh, the code annotated by a feature is uh, by uh, assigned to a certain color <coughs> and assigned to a certain uh, feature by the context menu. Features are visualized by means of those background colors. Uh, of course, again, we can choose the colors for certain features and if a feature is not assigned any color, then we can use a gray background color for that. Interesting is where, where to store this information and it's stored externally to the document while in preprocessor statements, we have this directly in the document. So it's like an in-place uh, variant of uh, putting the information and here it's, ex it's internal to the document and over here it's external. So we have, uh, we cannot change um, those documents outside of this particular editor. We can only use the colored editor. So why virtual separation? We can, uh, basically the source code um, is annotated in the abstract syntax tree, which means we can provide any source code view uh, based on the abstract syntax tree. In particular, we can hide certain code. Uh, we could say this parameter over here is uh, marked uh, as being some feature not relevant for my maintenance task. And now I'm hiding this feature. Um, we can see some feature code uh, being highlighted in a certain color. And it's possible to hide irrelevant features. It's possible to even show overlapping features. So we see this here that uh, these two colors are uh, overloaded over here and we uh, even do a mixture of colors uh, to see uh, how are these colors, uh, how are these features interacting with each other. And the idea of colored IDE, but also of virtual separation of concerns is to support the development despite the scattering and tangling. It will not help to reduce the scattering and tangling, but it will help us to develop the source code uh, um, uh, despite there is some scattering and tangling going on. And um, it's interesting that there are some tactical features. We don't need to deal with the commas uh, written. Uh, uh, for instance, over here, we don't need to specify under which combinations this comma is needed and the other comma is needed, which is something that would be needed for uh, preprocessors. We can efficiently detect type errors and how this is done in the research prototype will be uh, discussed in more detail in lecture 10. So this is a view on a feature. It's possible to look at all the base code that is always there and only select a certain feature and this feature is shown and instead of showing all the source code, so we will hide some of the source code, uh, we will see how the source code of a feature is included in its surrounding. And then we can uh, configure products, we can specify a configuration, and we can use it to generate and visualize new variants. And then there's also some useful navigation features. We can also hide uh, irrelevant parts for us uh, in certain views, like the Project Explorer in the Eclipse Integrated Development Environment. In the last part of the lecture, we talked about feature traceability, about 
preprocessor variability that suffers from scattering and tangling naturally because it's so fine-grained, we can edit everywhere, so that's why we have tangling because features might be tangled to each other and can be spread over several files. That's where the scattering comes from. Feature traceability can be established at least to some extent with tools, for instance, feature commander uh, or feature ID have uh, functionality available, but only for those features for which we have preprocessor directives anyway. Right? So if we have some further features in the code but not yet made optional, then we can still not uh, have the same problem as for any single system. We cannot use those tools uh, for features that are not marked with preprocessor directives. And then we have virtual separations of uh, concerns as an alternative to preprocessors, which is more like the research perspective uh, tools might be available somewhere in the future that realize something like this. So for practice, you could look at uh, why is it beneficial to have uh, feature traceability even for single systems. We talked about product lines here, but why is this something relevant also for single systems? And when it comes to undisciplined annotations, um, it's uh, possible to say only optional nodes in the abstract syntax tree can be annotated. So that's the idea of disciplined annotations. And uh, the question is, what, what are examples of such optional and non-optional, like mandatory types of nodes in Java? So if you consider a Java program, what would be the parts that you will be able to color and which parts will you not be able to color for a good reason because otherwise syntax errors would occur? So this is uh, an exercise which helps you to uh, think about this a bit more in detail. Uh, we again have a large catalog of questions on those three parts of the lecture. And in the lect next two lectures, we will talk about other techniques to implement product lines to realize the vision of features with compile time variability. And we will see that all of those techniques have certain advantages and disadvantages for the development of software product lines. Thank you for being with us. and. Uh, hope you that you enjoyed it and work on the practical tasks for yourself. See you next time.